Hey, art nerds! Welcome to 2023, the year of the rabbit. This is such an inspiring prompt for me because I love animals and I've been trying to do Lunar New Year illustrations for the past couple years. I was so inspired this year that I have two alcohol marker illustrations, you've already seen one of them, and two watercolor illustrations. And today we're going to talk about one of the watercolor illustrations. This is Hold On Tight. And and it features a tiny woman riding a jackrabbit. So grab your paints, grab your brushes, and let's get painting with Hold On Tight. The inspiration for this illustration comes from the idea that 2020 through 2022 has been horrible for a lot of people, a struggle for me as well, and I wanted some just really positive, good-natured vibes for 2023. So I'm hoping that this year will be a fun, wild ride full of adventure compared to the somewhat depressing, often isolating slog that has been 2020 through 2022. So this illustration was printed using my Magic Blue Lines printing technique on Canton Moulin de Roy watercolor paper. This is one of my favorite watercolor papers for standard watercolor illustrations, just something kind of straightforward like this. Now, the magic of the Blue Lines technique is that when you stretch your watercolor paper, the blue lines dissolve. So you do need to pencil or ink your illustration before you actually start to stretch it. So I went ahead and I did pencil it to clean up the illustration and then I inked it using a Sakura Pigma FB. So this is a pigment based brush pen that based on all of my usage is both alcohol marker safe and waterproof. The only thing I didn't ink is the circle behind them and I wanted that to be kind of light and kind of open. So there's just a faint bit of ghosting that you can still see if you look really closely and I use that as my guide to fill in the circle. So for the majority of this illustration, I'm going to be trying to use rounds and quills. I've got some Diane W slash Art Secret quills. Those are the blue quills that I'm trying to try out and see how I feel about them so keep an eye out for the big review where I talk about a bunch of different watercolor brushes from Amazon and AliExpress because I'm trying to you know mix up my rotation and find some new brushes that I'm going to really enjoy so once the first layer on the circle dried and it is a mix of cerulean blue with a little bit of cobalt blue so that we get kind of this really summery sort of blue color I'm adding a second layer in there because the first layer wasn't as striking as I really wanted it to be. And with the first layer of watercolor and anything, it was a little bit more streaky than I really wanted. So I wanted to make sure that I gave myself the chance to kind of fix that and kind of hide the streakiness and to really build up that color saturation that I wanted. Next, I want to start working on the letters, the hold on tight, and I wanted it to be kind of an orange gradient. So a yellow to kind of a bright, intense gradient with the main color being orange. So I start by mixing up kind of a base color, and that's the orange that you guys see here. I'm going to use this as my fill color just to kind of pre-wet the area. Before I do that, though, I clean up any cerulean blue that might have gotten into the illustration using my quills and a little piece of paper towel. So I'm going to paint a base color on all the letters first. This is going to kind of pre-wet the paper, and it's going to make it more receptive to the blending that I'm going to want to do here. It's also going to mean that we're not just painting a thick mix of watercolor directly on the paper, which that tends to have problems in my experience. I'm going to siphon off a little bit of the orange and mix it a little bit more saturated and give it another layer because it really was too light. It was not the color I was really looking for. So I'm going to start 
by kind of painting the center of the letters and I'm gonna go in with a warm yellow at the top and I'm gonna go in with red. I think I'm using scarlet red for this at the bottom and I'm gonna let them intermix. And I'm using three brushes for this. I know it's kind of hard to tell. I'm using two quills and a round to do this. So one of the quills contains our yellow, one of the quills contains our red, and one of the quills contains our base orange color. And that's more useful for blending out. And working with three brushes like this means that I don't have to rinse the brushes in between letters. So this is a reason why it might be helpful to have multiple brushes in a size that you really like if you wanna use the three brush technique. And this is a technique that I use very often when it comes to gradients. So if you like gradient work, or if you like gradients in your watercolor, this is definitely something you may want to invest in is having multiples of your favorite brushes. So for this kind of gradation, you are gonna have to give it a few layers. It's not really a one and done sort of thing. You may also want to add in more red or more yellow in some areas because as the colors kind of flow into each other and dry, they're gonna shift a little bit. So you are gonna to wanna to kind of readjust them. So I'm going in with another layer of orange adding in my red and then I'm going to be dabbing in the yellow at the top because once it had a chance to kind of dry and I could see how the colors shifted out it was leaning a little too light and a little too yellow and I really wanted this bold impactful kind of a hot orange at the bottom to kind of counteract the blue and to kind of help create a more exciting watercolor illustration design wise. While those letters are drying, I'm gonna start working on the rabbit. And I'm starting by painting in kind of the pinkish color for the ears. I recently picked up Winsor Newton's Rose Dior color, or Rose Dor, it's D-O-R-E, so it might be Doré. Even, it is French, and while I speak some French, I'm not good at it at all. But it's a wonderful color, it's kind of like a a fleshy toned pink that can be really useful as kind of an undercolor or to add some warmth to areas and I thought that it would be perfect for the ears. I'm also painting in the base layer for the eyes. I'm heavily referencing jackrabbits while I'm working on this so I've noticed that they have kind of like this tawny golden yellow eye with a dark brown or black iris and then a dark brown or black rim around the eye so I'm really trying to capture that. I am also painting in the base color for its fur, kind of a dusty, almost sort of creamy brownish color. This is just a base color so that we're not just leaving the white of the paper except for highlights on the fur. So one of the things that I really love about watercolor, especially if I am painting animals from reference, is that it kind of forces me to zone out and really just focus on what I'm seeing with the animal and how I wanna translate that to paper. I can't be too much in my own head. I can't be too worried about other things. So if you want to paint along, and I have shared the line art for this with my art nerds over on Patreon, I would highly recommend you work from reference and not just from how I'm painting it because there may be a direction in painting jackrabbits that you would prefer to go with. You may prefer to go with a color variation that's more common in your area of the country. But I added a little bit more of the Rose Dior, Dior door to the bottom of the ears to kind of imply the veins and blood vessels that are going from the ears into the rabbit's head. I've added some yellow ochre and queen gold to the not the eye. Is it the iris? It is the iris. And I meant to say pupil earlier. Sorry. I added more yellow ochre and queen gold to the iris of the eyes. And now I'm adding another coat of our kind of brownish mix. It's a mix of a little bit of burnt umber, a little bit of Van Dyke's brown, probably a little bit of red and a little bit of Venetian red and burnt sienna to kind of give the warmth that I was looking for based on the reference for this animal. And at this point, I'm trying to use my round to really kind of capture 
the base of the fur, if that makes sense. Like I'm not trying to do all the individual brush strokes, but I am letting my brush do a lot of the work. I'm trying to be kind of loose and light handed with the brush. I'm trying to leave some of our first layers still visible. And I'm also going to try to leave some of the chunkiness of the fur visible. I'm working, I'm thinking about the fur in tufts. So on our third layer, uh, and by the way, um, I'm not like necessarily letting these layers fully dry in between. We do have air conditioning in our house. Our house is pretty climate controlled. So things do tend to dry quickly here, despite living in Louisiana. That said, it's not fully dry. And I'm not really worried about that because having areas where some of it's still wet and blends out really, you know, softly, and then some of it is dry and we get like the crispy delineation on the fur, that really kind of adds a nice naturalism that otherwise I would have to go back in with a brush of clean water and try to, you know, <laughs> reenact myself. So I'm painting fairly quickly, but there are some areas that are drying kind of before I can get to them. And this is a fairly largish piece. I did cut it down to make it more square, but I believe it's like the 11, 11 inches that Canson Moulin de Roy is in, what is it, the A4 or the A3 size? I'm sorry, Jackson sells this in European sizes and that's a little confusing for me. So for the shadow color for the fur, which I wanted to work in kind of early so I could paint my layers on top of that, I mixed together some ultramarine blue, maybe a little bit of my Soho Urban Blue Violet, a little bit of Payne's Gray. And the reason I wanted to do kind of an ultramarine shadow color is even though we use cerulean blue and cobalt blue for the background, those are highly granulating blues. So I wanted some of that beautiful granulation in the rabbit's fur. And ultramarine blue is a really beautiful warm blue. And I really wanted that reflected in this. I wanted this illustration to have like an overall feeling of warmth and fun and adventure. Something to look forward to in 2023. Because when I do our, my year of animal illustrations, I'm really trying to convey some of the hopes or some of the goals for that year. So um, I mixed the... Uh, the, the shadow color a little bit darker and I'm starting to kind of dele delineate the areas that would like have harsher shadows like the areas under the saddle or the back legs or the back ears just to kind of add some depth and to kind of push them back a little bit. things about many earth pigments is that they tend to be a little bit opaque so it can be really helpful to add in your shadow colors early and then paint on top of them so that you're not creating mud or you're not lifting them back up or they're not getting all transferred this can be particularly helpful while you're painting fur so kind of adding that shadow tone glaze in the middle also allows us to kind of figure out the volume of our jackrabbit and it can allow us to more accurately add the fur as we wish. So I'm using really kind of short stubby brush strokes for this. I'm using a round and I'm really kind of just trying to allow the round to do its thing. So we're kind of like starting down kind of chunky and then getting wispier and more broken up. And there are areas where I want to blend it out a little bit more. So I'm adding water using a clean brush just to kind of break up some of those brush strokes and to kind of blend out some of that color transition. For this, I'm just going to kind of keep working it, not necessarily letting it dry all the way because that wet paper is going to allow for those softer, sort of more gentle transitions. And it means I don't necessarily have to grab a brush of clean water every time. So we're able to get kind of that randomness that you would see in fur where we have some patches that are kind of sticking up a bit more and some that seem like they're laying down a bit more. And to paint our jackrabbit's fur, I'm using a mix. Well, I'm adding to my initial mix color using a ceramic palette, but I'm using a mix of burnt umber as well as some Van Dyke brown. And the Van Dyke brown isn't quite as red and brown, if that makes sense. It's 
closer to black really than kind of the brown I was going for. So there are times when I'm going to kind of soften it up a bit and blend it out a bit. It was a bit cooler than I was really hoping for. I really should have mixed maybe some imeldazone brown in there or imeldazone red in there just to kind of warm it up a little bit so that it kind of matches better with our burnt umber. So although this tutorial has been time lapsed to around 50 minutes, just shy of an hour, it took three days of about eight hours each day of painting to complete this illustration. A pretty quick one for me because I'm not going for like hyper realism. And I spent a lot of time, I spent about a whole eight hours, the whole first day, just kind of blocking in this rabbit. Had a lot of fun doing it, but I do want to kind of disclose that to you guys because time lapsing can kind of give the impression that art takes less time than it does. And we already struggle as artists to get people to take us seriously when we tell them how long it takes us to complete things. For some reason, a week of time is like a weird time people period. People would believe me if I told them it took me three months to paint something. People would believe me if I told them it took me three hours to paint something. But for some reason, three days they always seem to think it should be faster than that so i like to try to disclose it when possible because i want to help demystify the time it takes to do illustration so while i'm waiting on some of the base layers on the rabbit to dry i'm going to go ahead and start doing kind of an under shadow color for her undershirt and i wanted to do kind of a paisley so i'm painting it an ultramarine blue to start and i'm going to allow that to dry fully because that is going to give us the shadow on the white areas of the paisley like a paisley handkerchief when i was a kid my dad worked in the oil industry and he always had paisley handkerchiefs and i just have them really closely associated with like my dad and western wear because my dad also grew up in the countryside so that explains that hopefully i did add some more layers onto the hold on tight working it just a little bit more so I'm pretty satisfied with how the jackrabbit has been blocked in. It's not finished, but it's a really good working start. And now I'm going to start working on the asters that are around the jackrabbit. So I really wanted to go with like the Black Eyed Susan sort of warm yellow petals with a brown center. And I'm working wet into wet using a multi brush for technique for this as well. So I am filling in the petals. I did a base layer first, kind of the same reason we talked about with the lettering. And then I'm doing a fill of yellow for each flower. And then around the center, I'm dabbing in some of that orange that we'd mixed for our hold on tight letters. And like I said, I'm working flower by flower. And when two flowers are adjacent, I give the first flower I painted a little bit of time to dry so that that orange doesn't flood back into that color and just totally kill all the work that we've done with developing a soft gradient. I wanted our writer to have a darker complexion so I'm going to start out by painting kind of the blush and the shadows on her first for the same reasons we did that with the jackrabbit earlier and I'm pulling out the rose dior because it's just a really nice kind of flush tone and then I mixed a bit of a mauve with a red violet to get kind of this under shadow color and this is going to make a lot more sense but as it dries it does also dry a lot lighter. I've also started mixing together her skin tone starting with a little bit of burnt sienna and a little bit of venetian red just to kind of get that base color down we are going to work it a little bit darker but because she's in full sunlight i didn't want to add in too many shadows or get too dark with this particular one so now that the flowers have dried, I'm going in and doing another layer. I'd lost a lot of the orangeness and a lot of the gradient that I wanted. So I'm basically replicating the same technique all over again. And 
now that I've got the flowers blocked in, I'm going to start moving on to the stems. And I really wanted to use warm colors for this illustration. For the most part, leaving our cooler colors as kind of an accent or a pop. So I'm starting with a green gold. And then I'm going to move into adding another layer on her skin tone. So that's one of the reasons I can paint as fast as I do, even in tutorials, is I'm not doing one thing at a time all the way to completion. I'm kind of jumping around and working on things as they dry and just trying to utilize my time as much as possible for that. So with our flowers, I'm adding another layer of green. This time I've mixed in some sap green. So we've got a little bit cooler and a little bit darker, but I am trying to leave a little bit of rim lighting on the leaves just so that we start to build in some depth and start to add in some lighting. Another little note is that for the most part, I address touch-ups as I see them or areas that need something as I notice it. But if it can't be addressed immediately, I'll actually make a note to myself on Discords that I remember to come back to it later. And as I'm working on watercolor illustrations, at the end of the evening, I'll often just kind of like sit and look at the illustration after taking a break and go ahead and make some notes for the next morning. Kind of let that simmer overnight, not make any rash decisions when I'm tired and kind of worn out and see how I feel about those suggestions the next morning. So I'm using the same wet and to wet kind of ombre technique for the center of the flowers. So I've painted in with Van Dyke Brown and then I'm dipping in a little bit of sepia. It's going to be a little bit harder for me to zoom in for you guys because I'm working all over the watercolor, <laughs> all over the watercolor page here. Um, kind of just working on her skin tone or working on the flowers or kind of just working on things as I think about them and I decide what colors I want to use for them or I notice areas that need adjustment. I've added a little bit of blush to her cheeks. It would be so much easier for me to zoom in and show you guys but unfortunately with so many of my watercolor illustrations I'm just kind of all over the place at a certain point and I don't really start focusing in or narrowing in until we've got everything kind of blocked in. So since she's a Lilliputian or she's meant to be a Lilliputian, I didn't necessarily want her outfit to come from just one inspiration source. I started by looking at the bolero jackets that bullfighters wore because it's got kind of like a festive jaunty look. So that's kind of the inspiration behind her jacket. And then I moved far more into rodeo wear, which would explain the chaps. And then the saddle is a weird kind of combination between fancy riding saddles, rodeo saddles, and harnesses designed for rabbits. So I wanted the saddle to look like something conceivably that a rabbit could wear. I am sure a jackrabbit would find a saddle terribly uncomfortable because they're just not used to it at all it would be like trying to saddle a poor zebra just no, nothing in their genetic history says this is okay or normal for them but this is a fantasy illustration and while i do like to ground it somewhat in reality and add some realistic touches i'm not necessarily looking to make it hyper realistic While I'm noodling around and kind of making adjustments to everything, I'm also thinking about the color palette, what colors I want to use on her outfit, what colors I want to use on the saddle, and what colors I want to use on the collar. So this not only gives me a chance to see how some of the other colors in this illustration develop, because with watercolor, it can be very hard to get things exactly the way you did them in the color comp or exactly the way you see them in your head. Sometimes they just respond differently on paper. Sometimes you get an idea that you want to explore or a technique that you want to try. So I find it kind of helpful to just kind of wait and see how things shake out and how I feel about colors before I totally commit, which is another reason why I bring up the fact that it took me about three days to complete this illustration. It takes time and thinking is a big part of making art and a big part of the art making process. And when we just rush through things, and I'm speaking from experience here, we don't give ourselves the time to really think about them and we may end up with pieces that are finished but we don't necessarily like them and we don't necessarily know why we don't like them so giving ourselves more time to think about things let the colors marinate let the colors dry and let our brains process what we've done 
can be a great way to level up your art without necessarily having to do anything more than take more breaks and take more time to just finish things. So I'm kind of developing the leaves at this point, adding in, so I wanna keep going with the warm, darker greens. So adding in some undersea green, adding in some Van Dyke green and some shadow green. I recently redid my watercolor palette. That's why the thing is huge. I like it so much better now. And it actually invites and allows me to use colors that I love that I hadn't been able to fit in my palette. So I never remembered to use them. I've got a vlog about the experience of <laughs> revamping my palette to share with you guys. So keep an eye out for that. Speaking of giving yourself time to think and analyze, I decided that I wanted to make the fur on the jackrabbit warmer. So I went in and I did a bit of a glaze using our burnt umber since that's a warmer brown. That's going to kind of add some warmth to our prior layers. It's also going to add us some more of the fur brush strokes and it's gonna add in a little bit of granulation which, which is going to work in our favor in creating the illusion of fur and softness. So I wanted a green for her jacket. I'm working wet into wet with this. I know it's a little bit hard to see. So I did kind of a base layer of a very light green and then dabbed in my much darker green. I think it's shadow green, wet into wet, and then dabbed in a more saturated mix of shadow green. I really wanted her jacket to feel like it was a velvet. So this really kind of soft texture. I added some indigo for her blue jeans. Actually, it's indigo mixed with this Mary blue, which my, my Marie, there we go, blue, which is like a marine blue, but it's really more like a midnight blue. It's kind of a warmish blue just to kind of warm it up so the denim itself didn't feel so cool. Like I said, I'm trying to go with kind of a warmer color palette for this illustration. And then I'm going in and just adding some shadows on the brass findings, the brass accents on the saddle adding in some Van Dyke Brown to the center of our rabbit's eyes and giving things kind of a chance to dry. At this point, I've got most of the elements that I 100% knew what I want them to be blocked in so I can start working on her outfit. And while I did have an idea for what colors I wanted her to wear, I did want to wait and see how I felt about them in comparison to the other colors that I had chosen. So for example, like her undershirt, originally it was going to be white. Then I decided I wanted to go with a really bright attention grabbing green and just kind of use this sort of paisley green theme throughout the illustration. I also decided that her chaps would be a reddish brown, but I didn't know how red versus how brown I wanted them to be. I'm using a Meldazone brown which is a whole bind color or it might be a meld zone red but it's like a brownish red it's a good sort of brick red color and it doesn't really granulate a whole lot it's it's pretty finely milled but I felt like that would make kind of a good base color for her chaps because I didn't want to go too wild with the colors because when I'm working on clothing for Lilliputians with the exception of like mall Lilliputians I try to keep their colors pretty natural pretty blended in with the environment, attractive yet somewhat stealth. So I decided to kind of continue the paisley pattern to, I believe this would be the blanket under the saddle. So I'm doing an under layer of blue. Now in retrospect, I think a madras print with some of the greens in it and maybe some of the reds in it would have also been really cute and might have felt more western wear it might have tied in a little bit better without being too repetitive but i had already decided to lean in and do the paisley pattern and the way i'm doing the paisley pattern is i'm using masking fluid to mask off our paisley pattern once i've already done our layers of ultramarine blue shading and they've dried fully allow the masking fluid to dry fully and then i go ahead and and I start doing the local color on top of that.
point, I also decided to move away from the hot pink that I was using on her after seeing how it looked with the reddish brown of her pants. And I added a layer of yellow on top of it. And what this is going to do is it's going to turn it into a really bright, like a neon red, which I felt worked a lot better for this piece. I do still really like the hot pink accents in like an abstract sense. I think that could be really cute on something else, but it didn't really work for what I was trying to do here. And adding that layer of yellow kind of warmed up the hot pink and turned it into a red instead. Now, originally I wanted there to be more variation in the greens I used. I wanted them all to be kind of cooler greens for like the clothing basically, but her shirt was going to be more of a yellow green. The tack was going to be more of a bluish green. And then the green accents on her collar were going to be an even darker green. I feel like I ended up kind of flattening everything out in that regard. They all ended up kind of the same sort of green color. And I'm not really thrilled about that. I do think having that diversity in the greens would have worked a lot better. But sometimes watercolor just kind of decides what it's going to do for you. And all you can really do is just kind of work with it. I'm going to do her saddle in a cobalt teal and orange. So I want to go ahead and start painting in the shadow color. And this is the same mix that I used for the rabbit itself. It's Payne's gray mixed with some ultramarine blue. So we get kind of that warmth and we also get kind of that granulation that's kind of tying everything together with this piece. At this point I've got her pretty blocked in. All that's really left is to block in the gear on the rabbit. I am adding in some more shadow colors on the blanket just to kind of add some more depth and to make it feel like it's really kind of working around the form of the rabbit. But I'm really going to be focusing on the saddle and the tack for the most part. While I wait for that to dry though, I'm going to start with her hair. Now realistically a really bright color like um kind of a type of blonde might have worked really well to balance this out and it might have harkened back to the flowers down at the bottom but I decided to give her darker hair so I did a base layer so that we have kind of our highlight already built in because if you're familiar with watercolor watercolor is reductive so you want to start with your highlights and kind of bake them in early on and then leave those as you paint your darker layers on top. So for the orange of the saddle, it is a mix of Sennelier's Chinese Orange, Turner's Quinn Burnt Sienna, and I think a little bit of yellow or maybe some Quinn Gold. It's looking like a little bit of yellow here and there because while I wanted it to be orange, I wanted it to be like a saddle brown orange and not necessarily the same orange that we use in our lettering or that we used on our flowers. And I want to kind of keep this as a through line throughout the tack. So it's the main body of the saddle as well as the strap that goes kind of around the chest of the rabbit. So a while back, I ordered some different kind of eyedroppers from St. Louis Art Supply. That's the small one that you guys see me using there as well as a bellows. The bellows is so good. I undersold it in the unboxing video, but I've been using it a lot to transfer water, to transfer paint mixes. And it's a weird little thing, but I really enjoy using it and I highly recommend it. 
I think originally I bought it just so that I could like maybe transport water or add water to wells, but it's way more flexible than that. And I thought I would just give it a little shout out because I'd kind of undersold it when I'd open it. And sometimes it takes a while of using something. So with my new palette, I've kind of combined my Daily Driver palette with my Naomi palette. And it's called my Naomi palette because it's kind of the colors that my character Naomi would wear, but also it's like special handling colors. So colors that are more opaque that might have more optical brighteners in them or are neon so they require just different ways of mixing them different ways of handling them so I am using the cobalt teal from this to get that just really really pretty sort of teal color I mean there's not really a better word for that and I also mixed in I forget what the blue is I think it might be a manganese blue hue right next to it just to warm it up a little bit because it was a little bit green and I as I keep saying I really want this piece to feel warm and sunny and adventurous so that's going into every color choice that I'm making and that's something that I really kind of like about watercolor is that you have to make commitments with it. You can adjust it, but you need to make commitments with it. I, as someone who also does a lot of work digitally and I do a lot of corrections digitally, I can't just like slide the hue and saturation bars or I can't just add like a layer effect or a filter to adjust things the way I want them. I have to learn how to mix the colors and how to layer the colors and experiment with the colors to get what I want. And I think working both digitally and traditionally in many ways makes me stronger when it comes to this ability to learn and problem solve because I sure do make a lot of mistakes and I sure have wasted a lot of paint over the years and doggone it if making mistakes isn't a great way to learn how not to do that especially when it costs you time and money. So um, as you guys see I went ahead and I painted the tassels that hot pink my goal for them is for them to match kind of the epaulets and the sleeves on her jacket. So we're going to do a layer of yellow once that hot pink dries. And when used in like a larger area, I have to say like a hot pink, especially a hot pink that granulates a little bit or a hot pink with a yellow that granulates a little bit, you get that like really vibrant red, but there's also a little bit of that granulation going on. And it is just so pretty. It's, it's so good. So um, while I'm waiting for those layers to dry and thinking about the colors, I'm going back in with our asters and kind of just, they're not really asters, asteracea, and just kind of adjusting the petals and trying to get more of that depth. They kind of flattened out for this and I want to kind of bring some of that back in. I'm also adding in some shadow to the saddle and I decided to go in with like the imeldazone brown for that because it's going to give us that shadow and it's going to give us that depth, but it's not going to cool it down too much because we already did our shadow color with the Payne's gray and the ultramarine blue. And I'm a little bit nervous that if I glaze over it again, we're going to get too much of the ultramarine blue. So the way ultramarine blue tends to granulate, it can sometimes granulate a little too much and when used in a mix, it can sometimes make it start to look kind of dirty or kind of muddy or not really properly handled. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't fall into that. So all this time I'd been kind of holding back on rendering the under collar that the rabbit is wearing because I hadn't quite decided what kind of green I wanted to go with that. And I wanted to kind of see how the other greens looked and how they shook out before I really went with that. And I decided to go with a darker green kind of matching her jacket. So I'm starting with a really light green because as we've talked about, you got to start with your highlights and then add your darker colors on top of that. I think acrylic and oil, you can kind of work more free from free form. I know with gouache, you often can start dark and then add your your highlight layers on top of that, like you're building up the color. But watercolor is a bit like woodblock where you're working a bit reductively. Each layer you add, you are adding less. You're trying to like leave layers still visible. That's probably hard to explain, but you're watching a watercolor tutorial. So you probably have some idea of what I'm talking about. 
at this point, things are mostly blocked in. We have a good idea of what color things are going to be. So it's going to mostly be about adjusting things and adding shadows, allowing things to dry, things like this. So this is kind of a good opportunity just to talk about how much fun I had with this watercolor illustration. So revamping my palette, adding in some new colors, trying out some different brushes. That's all been a really good way for me to kind of bring some fun in for me into my watercolor illustration. Trying out new things adds novelty and it can be a good way to kind of freshen something up or to make something that's become kind of routine, unusual again, as you either learn how to new, use the new colors or you're figuring out how to use the new brushes or some common combination of them. Now the paper I'm painting on Moulin de Roy is like a really good just kind of standard paper. I think I like it a little bit better than Arches. It's just a workhorse paper. It's not gonna, it doesn't have like the paper texture to give you like really wild granulation or really vibrant wet into wet mixes. It's not a paper for chaos but it is a great paper for illustration because it just it behaves really well. It holds onto the water really well. I wish it was more commonly available in the US. If I want Moulin de Roy, I have to order through Jackson's. And not that I don't like ordering through Jackson's, but it's not like I can like run down to the store and pick up some more Moulin de Roy. I could probably change that though, because David's does order things that customers request. So I could probably ask them to start carrying Moulin de Roy again, because that's how I found out about it was my own local brick and mortar art supply store. So got to give them a shout out because they always have supplies and they're really nice there and they're willing to order for you if you live in like the metro new orleans area david's art center is great it's, i've been going since i was 14. it's one of my favorite art supply stores and it's a local business the owners are super nice the employees are super nice and if you live around here you should definitely check it out so i did add that layer of yellow to the tassels you guys can see it turns out a little bit more red and then I'm adding in probably alizarin crimson to start adding in some of the shadows. So I've talked about in some of my other watercolor tutorials how I don't like telling you guys exactly what paints I'm using, partially because I don't always know. Sometimes to be able to show you what I'm painting, I can't have my palette in the shot at all. I tried really hard to show at least some of my palette this time. I had, as you guys can see, the accruing mass of ceramic saucers and palettes. Um, I had a bigger workspace than I really wanted to show on camera, mostly because then you couldn't see what I was painting. But um, I also want to encourage you guys to use the paints that you have and the paints that you like and the combination of colors that work for you. Uh, I do try to like give you guys a gist of what types of color, whether it's a cool yellow or a warm yellow or an opaque yellow or, you know, um, just because I have learned a lot from other watercolor artists from the types of blends they like to do and what they feel like those blends achieve for them. But when it comes to watercolor, I paint with a variety of professional grade watercolor paints, just kind of whatever I happen to like that happens to get me the effect that I want. So it's hard for me to be like, and buy this one brand because there's just so many good brands that I really like. So I finished kind of adding in my details and I let everything dry overnight coming into it the next morning and I'm using a masking fluid pickup to pick up the masking fluid on our paisley. I want to work really delicately delicately with this because sometimes masking fluid pickups can pick up your more granulating or your more opaque colors and kind of erase them and I'm sure you could probably use that as a technique now that you know about it, but that was not what I was trying to do here. So I was trying to really just delicately pick up the masking fluid. Now there are some artists who can literally use their fingertips to pick up the masking fluid, but my hands are so, 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 so dry that I cannot. So another great thing about letting it dry overnight is that the colors, the pigments kind of settle into the paper so I can do more layers, do more blending. So as I mentioned earlier, I blocked in the rabbit, but I wasn't totally finished with the jackrabbit. So now I'm going in with the darker colors because if you reference a jackrabbit, it's got this agouti coat, which is like a mix of different colors. So kind of like a squirrel, um, you've got your gray browns and your warm browns and your darker browns all and your light, light, light cream color browns all kind of 
mixed in and that helps camouflage the animal in their environment. So I really wanted to make sure that I captured that and I am working with Van Dyke Brown and sepia to start kind of blocking in those darker areas blending them out with a little bit of water when it feels a little bit too intense or like I covered too large an area with it and it's just kind of a back and forth and I'm really trying to let the brush do the work and what I mean by that is I'm not just trying to fill the area I am trying to be mindful about my brush strokes and keeping them kind of light and keeping them kind of fluid and keeping them kind of loose and if I don't like how it turns out going back over it with some more burnt umber and with this time more as like a glaze with the intention of melting some of those colors and getting them to soften up and loosen up and move around and that's another great thing about Moulin de Roy is it is a secret workhorse of a paper it can really take a lot of layers it can take a lot of working it's, it's a good paper if you have it easily accessible to you and you're looking for a good workhorse watercolor paper, I can't really recommend it enough. So I wanted to add some more shading to the background limbs on our jackrabbit just to kind of start pushing that volume. I probably could have left them light and that would have pushed the contrast a little bit more, but I knew I was going to go back into this with a uh, off-white color pencil, off-white uh, white watercolor pencil, and gouache. So I knew that I was going to be able to go back in and kind of add some of that rim lighting and that highlighting back in. So I wasn't super worried about it. Now, often with my inked watercolor illustrations, I do decide to go back in and re-ink it for clarity because they can sometimes start to feel muddy. I decided not to do it with this piece because it didn't need it, which was nice. It saved me some time. Everything has had several hours to dry. I'm coming back to this piece after some time away. I am using Daniel Smith's Buff Titanium that I've allowed to dry in a half pan. I'd reconstituted it and I'm using that to start adding in some highlights. So the thing about Buff Titanium is it isn't like a true replacement for off-white. I need to buy some off-white gouache as well, but it is a nice warmer color that can be useful sometimes for adding highlights into like fur. I'm also using my favorite watercolor pencils. I have four brands that I'm going to go ahead and recommend here. I am using Ken, uh, Karen Dash's Museum Aquarel, which are great, but kind of expensive. I am using Faber-Castell's Albrecht Durer, which are good, but they can be sometimes muddy and kind of opaque. They are India ink based. So once you've wet them and they've dried, they are going to be indelible, much like Derwent Ink Tents, which I am also using and I also like. And I am also using Karen Dash's Super Color 2. And I did a big watercolor pencil review a couple years ago. So if you're curious about which watercolor pencil is right for you and which ones are worth their money, you should check that out. But at this point, I am using that off white watercolor pencil to add in some of those rim lighting hairs and to lighten up some areas and to kind of break up some areas. I also decided that I wanted to kind of clean up the lettering a little bit, add some darker red at the bottom so we get more of a color split and kind of blend it out a bit more and also just kind of clean up some of the areas where I might have gotten outside the lines. That's another another great thing about Moulin de Roy pen paper is that if you make a mistake it is very easy to scrub it up and clean it up. So generally, if I need to adjust shadows, I like to use an indigo ink tense. 
and um, depends on what I'm looking for. So if I'm looking to do like a larger area of shadow, I'll use the side of the ink tent and really let the texture of the paper kind of break it up. If I need it to be more like solid or less like dry brush looking, I can melt that using some water that sometimes makes it a little bit darker though. So you wanna be kind of picky about that, but it also allows you to blend it in with the rest of your illustration a little bit better, which I really like. But like the ears needed a little bit more black in them as well as more uh, indigo, just kind of add some shading. And now I can start adding in more of like the white accents using the off-white and the white. And I have to say an off-white watercolor pencil is really handy because the white tends to be very bluish and it can really kind of deaden things. So an off-white is warmer, but still white enough to read as white and to read as highlights. I really need to pick up some off-white gouache for the same reason, because white gouache can be a little bit bluish and can have a tendency to deaden things or flatten things out. That said, I have switched over to using gouache. I would recommend switching over to a smaller, brush. I have a terrible, terrible confession to make. I just dip the brush inside the gouache container because I am not a gouache artist. I don't use gouache frequently. I basically just keep white gouache around and it works for me. It's less wasteful than squeezing it out on the palette and then not using hardly any of it. Is it disgusting? Probably, but it works. Also gonna go ahead and give my compulsory apology for when my face gets in the shot. My eyesight is terrible. So sometimes I have to get really on top of it. And I tried to keep my camera pulled out more for this illustration that you guys, so that you guys could see more of the palette since I am breaking in a new palette. And because often I pull in really tight with my illustrations and then you can't see the palette at all. So I do kind of try to mix things up, but it does mean my head is going to get in the shot more. I did try to zoom in and crop in editing so that you guys could see what I'm doing a little bit better. But as you guys can see, not always an option. And I'm sorry, I know I look a little bit unhinged. I'm just really focused on finishing this illustration. Speaking of finished, it is just about finished. I just need to wait for the watercolors themselves to fully dry before we can remove our blue tape. So I peel my tape away, pulling away at a 90 degree angle so that if it tears, it doesn't tear into the illustration. I have tried the hairdryer technique to soften the adhesive. Y'all, that does not work for me. It actually made it stick a lot worse. So if it works for you, good on you. I'm glad I tried it, but it did not work for me. I'm not trying to scare anyone off. It is a technique that a lot of artists use, so it's probably worth a shot just saying it didn't work for me. And here is our finished 2023 Year of the Rabbit Hold On Tight illustration. I still have two more rabbit inspired illustrations to work on, one more marker one and a watercolor one. So if you like rabbits, stick around. I really loved painting this illustration. I'm really happy with how it turned out. It's a larger one with a lot of smaller details. So I'm not sure what I can do with it because it does not show up well on social media at all, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. And I'm really glad that I was able to share this process with you guys. I hope this was helpful, useful, and inspiring for you guys. If you liked it, make sure you leave a thumbs up, maybe leave me a comment of encouragement. I sure would appreciate it. And consider subscribing for more watercolor reviews and tutorials. Have a wonderful day, guys. And huge, immense, ginormous thanks to my amazing patrons on Patreon. Thank you guys so much. I will be sharing the line art as a principal on Patreon in case you guys want to paint or color or marker along with me.